We're witnessing the very first stages of the removal process of the Puvi de Chavan philosophy panel here at the Boston Public Library. So this project is the culmination of almost 14 months of planning. We spotted some initial bubbling of the mural back in 2014, and in fact, upon further investigation by our conservators, it was revealed that a good 80, 80 plus percent had actually come off due to plaster declination in the back. Working with John Franco Pocobene and Ian Hodgkinson, who are the top wall painting conservators in their field, certainly on this continent, they have developed a groundbreaking method to remove this panel from the wall. This particular mural, the Philosophy Panel, which is one of the eight panels in the Grand Staircase, were painted by Puvi de Chavan in 1895-96, shipped over to America, and they were mounted to the wall with a particular adhesive, which is very permanent and uh, they're mounted on plaster. And uh, we know that over the years, that particular mural uh, received some water infiltration, moisture penetrating the plaster, which has been going on for decades. We do know that there is an elevator shaft backing this mural. So it's been a cumulative process spurring from some initial leak that happened many, many years ago. Just last year, Megan Weeks called me in and said she thought she saw something strange about the canvas. And uh, when I came in, I realized that a lot of the canvas had in fact undulated and separated from the wall. You could clearly see that it was starting to hang. So we erected staging and did an initial survey of the surface and came to the conclusion that somewhere between 75 and 80% of the canvas portion of the mural had detached from the wall. We also noticed that the plaster at the top of that arch is also separating away from the structure below it. So the worry there, of course, is that something catastrophic could happen. I actually then realized that this was a very uh, complex and difficult project, and I asked my former uh, professor from Queen's University up in Kingston, Ontario, to uh, come and look at it and join me in figuring out how we were going to do this project. Yes, it is a, a kind of a project that has never really been done before. Not surprising, because the technique that was used uh, of adhering the canvas to the wall with uh, an adhesive composed of linseed oil and white lead uh, is extremely permanent. This uh, mural cycle by Puvi de Chavan is the only uh, one of his uh, mural cycles outside France. And uh, Boston is really lucky to have it. It's a national treasure. Pierre Puvi de Chavannes was really the go-to muralist in the 19th century. He was the most highly regarded muralist in all of France, and it was a massive coup to get him to contribute to the new Boston Public Library. The statute that governs the founding of the library goes back to 1848, uh, but the building of the library here itself took place in the period 1888 to 1895. And it's within that period that the original murals were installed on the staircase of the building. And this building was really the product of one man, Charles Fallon McKim, and his masterful collaboration with other artists, designers, and craftsmen. Puvi was just one of those artists whom McKim approached to contribute to what he called this palace for the people. It was thought from the very beginning that in order to create a citizenry of Boston, that was educated, they would also need to be inspired. And certainly the art and architecture here at the Boston Public Library makes this building and this institution into a masterpiece. Puvi he was getting on in years by the time he accepted this commission. He was 72 years old, not keen to travel the distance from Paris to Boston. And so he asked that Charles Fallon McKim send him a sample of the yellow sienna marble that we see surrounding the staircase, as well as the dimensions of this area so that he could key his palette appropriately and certainly size the linen canvas. The collections of the Boston Public Library number approximately 24 million objects in total, and that spans both the general circulating collection through to a vast collection of prints, manuscripts, rare books, additional artwork, and special collections. And we treat the art in the building and the building itself as its own special collection too. The biggest challenge is getting the painting off the wall safely. It's going to be a very big challenge. One of the problems being that uh, uh, the painting is in a recess, uh, so there is no way of getting access to it from the sides or from the top. 
Fortunately, uh, there was a, a fascia of marble at the bottom which we could uh, remove uh, to allow us to get access to the bottom of the painting uh, so that we can uh, begin the removal of process from, from the bottom up. This process of removal will take approximately three weeks, at which point the mural panel will be taken upstairs to our Cerberus room, and that will begin a process of a further eight weeks. The eight-week process will involve lining the mural with a supportive honeycomb backing that will create a barrier between the mural surface or the painting surface, the canvas, and then the backing wall. So we're looking at some conservation work on the panel face, relining, and then ultimately, six to eight weeks later, reinstallation of the panel. It went very smoothly today, and uh, we were actually delighted to see that uh, it was going in the way that we expected it to go. And so now we have uh, enough space at the bottom to be able to start the removal. What we have to do is protect the surface, and that involves applying paper, tissue, canvas, gluing it on there temporarily to hold everything in place to do that. We had also these uh, support panels which were mounted onto the surface as we were working our way behind the mural. There are three layers of plaster that, that go into creating a plaster wall typically from this period. What we found though was that those layers towards the back of the structure were actually fairly crumbly. We used a combination of tools, which are basically slate rippers, which we modified to get in behind the plaster. It goes in under the slate, and this hooks around the nail. They brandished these massive sword-like uh, spatulas in order to get up underneath the mural, knowing that they wouldn't necessarily be able to torque the mural uh, far enough off the wall. They were going to have a very narrow space to work with. We also combine that with a technique which kind of goes back to the removal of frescoes in Italy, sort of vibrate the surface. They were actually able to agitate the plaster enough that it was actually just able to fall off. Of course, it's not an easy process, but the actual procedure of removing it and getting the remaining plaster off of the backing wall seemed to go very smoothly. In many ways, the library has much in common with museums. Although our mission uh, tends to be much more on the educational front, many people and tourists come here to simply enjoy the art in its place. The Philosophy Panel is one of eight panels that surround the McKim Grand Staircase. All of these panels depict allegorical subjects that one could learn about in the library. The philosophy panel is situated on the far left-hand side of the left wall and depicts two figures discoursing, along with a figure set back behind them reading a bound codex book, which, incidentally, did not exist in classical times, which was the period which Puvi was trying to emulate with this very fresco-like appearance of wall painting. Moving to the right of philosophy, we have the astronomy panel, three Chaldean shepherds regarding the stars. The stars are rendered as raised bits of lead-white paint that can actually glisten in certain lights. To the right of the astronomy panel, we have the history panel. The history panel shows a red-robed figure calling up spirits of the past from the caves below. On the wall facing outwards to the McKim courtyard, flanking the central windows, are two more panels. On the left, we have an expression of chemistry, a tall female figure waving her wand over three small fairies who are mixing elements. At the far right of the windows, we have probably the most out of place panel in the cycle. This panel, exploring physics, includes a nod to modern technology. Visible at the lower left of the panel is a telegraph wire. Two figures, one a white robed figure at the top of the panel, bearing an olive branch, carries good news across the telegraph wire. Below her, a figure in gray counters her by carrying bad news. This image explores what Puvi called the mystical power of electricity, 
and mankind's ability to harness it. Moving to the right-hand side of the staircase, we see three panels that show three types of poetry. At the far left, a figure of Virgil, author of the Aeneid, stands in a grove by a stream, representing pastoral poetry. At center, a figure of Aeschylus, and he's reading off of a long scroll at lower right, while behind him, a figure is bracing himself on a rocky outcrop as he's being harassed by the sea nymphs, representing dramatic poetry. And then, at the far right-hand side of this wall, there is an image of Homer, a seated, robed figure who is being crowned by the Iliad and the Odyssey. They together represent epic poetry. The broad panel flanking the entrance to Bates Hall shows nine muses. They're all bearing instruments, either of mathematics, music, or measurement, and they are welcoming the spirit of enlightenment. Flanking the doorway to Bates Hall at left and right are two stone-like figures. At left is a figure of study, holding a tablet, and at right we have the figure of contemplation. We also brought all nine of these murals online so that people could see and enjoy them. And what we find in many cases is that once people discover them online, they also want to come visit the objects in person. What we were doing up to that last minute before we actually did take it down was applying braces, basically studs, vertically running up the face of the construction and then also cross members because we wanted to make sure that once it was off the wall, the excess canvas that we had applied to the surface of the mural could be stretched around those panels. Well, anytime you take an artwork or an object of that size off-site, there's a bit of a concern, obviously, in the transport. So we were thinking in our minds of a place in the library that was currently offline to exhibitions or other programs. And we came up with the idea of bringing it into the Chevrous Room, which is just off of the Sargent Gallery that surrounds us here. Jen, can you And we also go flying. Yeah. Should someone be right down there? No. Yeah, but should we block them? Yeah. We calculated that the total weight of the mural you know, whatever plaster was still stuck on the reverse of it, and then also this temporary rigid panel construction was upwards of 375, 400 pounds. Okay, that's good. The removal process was a really fascinating thing to watch, to actually crank the painting down off the wall. All right, we're down. We're down. Yay! Yay! You guys are great. Great work. The mural is just a little over seven feet wide, so that allowed us then to tip it on its side, and there was the access space on one side of the scaffolding by the lobby there to be able to walk it out onto that surface. One, two, three. Lean it back and touch. I don't want it to the edge of the painting touching the ground so much. And lean it back slightly a little bit more. Just, that's good, that's perfect. Okay. We want the painting on the edge of the framework here, okay? We don't want to lean it forward because it will catch the edge of the painting. Sorry about that. Okay, just a couple of feet, let's go. Beautiful. Okay, we're good, we're all clear now. Careful of the tilt. The most harrowing moment was perhaps getting the panel in the door just behind me here. John Franco and Ian measured every turn and every angle so that they could address any of these issues ahead of time, and yet it was a pretty tight squeeze. We got about six inches. The only tricky part was that we had to remove these railings that are around this just so that we could run it in. One, two, three. One. All right, rest it. It's just a slow, methodical move, but uh, it went basically pretty well, I mean, as well as we wanted it to go. Puvi created these works to 
function as a continuation of the architecture. They're really well integrated into the space, both their palette and their form. It fits so well into the building. It's been fascinating to see this become its own individual painting. From now on, it's all basically standard kind of techniques. I think the most difficult part of this project is that we're dealing with a mural that's over 14 feet high by 7 feet wide. So in terms of manipulating it and um, you know, doing the steps, uh, is, I think that's the more complicated part, is just handling it. Because you can't roll the canvas off the surface, we made the decision that the plaster that was still adhered to the canvas had to come with the mural when we were detaching it. This yellow surface that you see here is actually the back of the lead white adhesive that was initially applied to the plaster wall, uh, but that's where the moisture has affected the bond between those surfaces. So the lead white adhesive has actually remained attached to the canvas, come with it, and very little of it remained on the actual plaster wall. And then the white chunks that you see towards the perimeter of the mural are the plaster layers that we're um, carefully uh, detaching from the surface. So the painting was prepared, we uh, tacked on an interleaf fabric, which means it sits between the original surface, the reverse of that, and the honeycomb panel that it's gonna go on. Then we flipped the painting on its back from the floor onto this work table, which is also gonna be our lining table. And that then allowed us to remove all the support panels that had been attached to the face of the mural when we were actually doing the removal from the plaster wall in the niche. Uh, which were just screwed down and sort of stretched on the edge of the fabric that was on the surface of the painting. That fabric we uh, removed uh, by applying uh, the appropriate solvent to dissolve the adhesive, uh, making sure to, as we're pulling the, the linen back that you're holding it nice and flat. You don't want to pull on it upwards because then you distort the painting and you could actually rip the paper facing that's on the painting also. So it's a very careful, methodical process. That all came off very successfully, and right now we're in the middle of just doing some stabilization of the paint on the fronts, a few areas that need it, and preparing the, uh, the surface of the painting for the actual lining procedure, or mounting onto the solid support panel that we have. Working with such a, a large scale piece of artwork has been a big challenge. I'll work sheet by sheet. The sheets are about um, a foot and a half by a foot and I'll use the mineral spirits to dissolve the artist varnish, which is used to adhere the Japanese tissue paper. So the painting originally was attached to a plaster support, and we decided that we weren't going to reinstate the plaster in that niche, because if there's ever an issue with water again, all we're going to do is recreate the damage that occurred in the past. So we wanted to avoid that and we made the decision to mount the painting onto an aluminum honeycomb panel. The beauty of the panel is that once we've installed it, it'll be easily detached. There'll just be some brackets holding it against the side of the niche. And again, in the future, if they have to remove it, they won't be going through this procedure. They can basically pull the panel out of the wall and it's ready to go. So the next phase now is taking advantage of the fact that uh, aluminum is a great conductor of heat. And the adhesive that we're going to apply to the panel is heat activated. So what we'll be doing is creating an envelope around the whole panel. You draw a vacuum on that, you pull the air out of it, and then there will be heat sheets, four by eight sections of silicone underneath the panel. The adhesive is activated, and then when you get to that point, you turn off the heat, and you cool it down under vacuum and the adhesive is then set and holding it at room temperature. And then basically once the painting is in that state that we've got it all basically restored to the point we want it to be, we will pick up the panel, move it back down to the second floor into the grand staircase. Staging will be set up ahead of time and if all goes well, it's gonna look like we didn't do anything. The panel itself is about 125 pounds and there may be even another 20 pounds or so of actual painting and you know canvas material. So it probably doesn't exceed 150 pounds.
most difficult part actually was getting it onto the staging because we didn't build a huge platform. We only had maybe a touch over a quarter of an inch left to right. Top and bottom was not a problem because there's a cavity below. So, you know, once we got it onto that ledge and sort of shimmied it in, uh, it, it actually just sort of fit right in nicely. Watching the piece go back up was like watching magic because again this is just not something that most people bear witness to. It was really incredible to see the work go as smoothly as it did. It's a real tribute to the conservation team and all of their support. As staff members and as stewards of this collection it's so important that we're looking out for these works and it's a privilege to be able to work with people like John Franco, like Ian, like their entire staff, um, these consummate professionals and these all-stars in conservation. The fact that they're so committed to keeping these masterpieces alive and safe, it's a real tribute to the arts community in Boston and beyond. It looks to me just like the way it would have looked when it was put there in the first place. There's a surprising number of uh, mural paintings of, uh, of this type and even frescoes in North America, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and the, the time will come when, uh, when they have to be uh, treated. The techniques that we used uh, can be used uh, elsewhere and adapted and improved. Right from beginning to end, it was a tremendous project. Uh, the collaboration with Ian was really special. It's one of the things I'll always remember in terms of the work I've done in my career. And then also just hats off to all the people who worked on the project. Uh, you know, really great, skillful, loyal, dedicated people who worked really, really hard. Also, just my uh, appreciation of being able to work with the, uh, the Boston Public Library. Again, great people, incredibly supportive and um, understanding about everything we had to go through. Never forget that experience either. Mm -hmm.